I've learned to know a name I highly treasure. Oh, how it thrills my spirit through and through. Oh, precious name beyond degree or measure. My heart is stirred whene'er I think of him. My heart is stirred whene'er I think of Jesus. That blessed name which sets the captive free. The only name through which I find salvation. No name on earth has meant so much to me.
sinner, lost and left to die. Oh, raise your head, for love is passing by. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus and live. Now your burden's lifted and carried far away and precious blood has washed away the stain so call on jesus call on jesus call to jesus and live like a newborn baby don't be afraid to crawl Remember when you walk, sometimes you fall. So fall on Jesus, fall on Jesus, fall on Jesus, and live. Sometimes the way is lonely, each step is filled with pain. So if your sky is dark and pours the rain, Sing for Jesus, sing for Jesus, and live. And with your final heartbeat, kiss the world goodbye. Then go in peace and laugh on glory's side. And fly to Jesus, fly to Jesus, fly to Jesus, and live. Fly to Jesus, fly to Jesus, fly to Jesus, and live. Amen. Amen. Good song, good music today, and thank you all for that. Like I've said many times, it's so much easier to preach after a good song than after a bad song. And you all know what a bad song is, and there hasn't been any of those today. And so far, anyways, come back tonight, and you may not be able to say that. Because <laughs> you never know about that Etal person, what he's going to be doing. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, please, will be our text. Uh, in just a few moments we're going to read that. But I want to just uh, make a few comments and say that I'm going to be continuing this morning in the series called Stewardship, A Way of Living. And we've seen so far about how we're to give our body a living sacrifice. We're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We're to let God give us strength to do whatever it is that God wants us to do. And again tonight, or this morning, I've only got one verse to read. And, uh, but I do want to make a few more introductory comments and say this every day to the Christian. We are in a battle. And you say, well, this battle is, we're facing today is not on a battlefield anywhere. It's not between two, uh, two militaries. It's, uh, it's, uh, it, takes, it takes place every day inside of our bodies. It's between the flesh and the spirit. It's between our old man and our new man. It's between our self and our Savior. Our flesh wants to do one thing and our spirit wants to do another thing. So if you and I, if we're going to win this battle in our bodies, the flesh first spirit battle, and if we're going to be good stewards of what God's given to us and if we're going to serve God to the best of our abilities, then, then we have to have a funeral every day for our flesh. Would you please stand to your feet, please, as I read Galatians chapter 2. I'm just going to read verse 20. Galatians 2, verse number 20. 
Paul says this, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. I want to preach this morning a message called this, The Funeral of Our Flesh. The Funeral of Our Flesh. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you today for letting us be in church again. We ask you, God, to please take the next few moments in the words that are said and please help them to be beneficial to us. God, I pray you may help every believer in here today to die to the old man, to die to the flesh, and live unto the Spirit, God. I pray for those who may be here and are not saved. They're not Christians today. God, I pray they may call upon you to be their Savior today. I pray they may repent of their sinfulness and turn to Christ Jesus to be their Savior. And whatever you accomplish today during this time, we're going to give you all the praise and give you all the glory we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please have a seat if you don't mind. Thank you so much for standing. I appreciate that very much today. Today, this morning in Sunday school, I tried to get these words out, but something happened in my brain and it didn't go from my brain to my mouth. But here's what I tried to say. I'll try to say it again. Today is the last Sunday of January. Is that right? I got it right that time. Okay, this morning, man, I could not get that out. But it's the last Sunday of January, the last Sunday of the first month of the new year. And uh, we all probably made some kind of resolution And maybe five weeks later, it's been five whole weeks now, and maybe some of the things we said we're going to do this year we have not been able to accomplish. Maybe some, uh, which by the way, this is a very good thing to do. Maybe some have said, you know, this year, 2016, this is the year I'm going to take off a few pounds. And uh, for a couple of weeks, things were going great. I mean, you started eating a little bit better. You uh, You started exercising. You even joined a gym. I know the gym where I go to, the first couple of weeks, I mean, it was crowded, like they were giving away something, but now it's kind of back to normal. Uh, and then he thought, well, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, this year, I'm going to save more money. I'm going to spend less and save more. I, I've been listening to Clark Howard and Dave Ramsey, and this year is going to be the year that I work on my finances. And so you thought, well, the first couple of weeks, things are going well. You spent less, and you saved more. You even started using coupons and going to Aldi and things like that. But now those things you've kind of forgotten about. Maybe this year you said, well, this is the year, 2016. This is the year I'm going to read through my Bible. And so every day from January 1 to about January 15 or so, you read your Bible every day. You made it all the way through the book of Genesis. But the next day came and you said, well, I'll skip today and tomorrow I'll read twice as much. Or I'll skip a couple days and come uh, next day I'll read a little bit more. And you've gotten behind and maybe now you haven't been able to call it up. Maybe you haven't even read your Bible at all the last few days. There's some maybe decided you're going to pray more or give more or witness more. And for a few days, things are going well. You prayed more, you gave more, and all these things were happening. And now maybe you haven't witnessed to somebody in two or three weeks. What happened? Well, I'll tell you what happened. The flesh wants one thing, and the spirit wants another thing. There's a battle inside of our bodies that takes place between the good guy and the bad guy. Your flesh wants to sleep in and not go to the gym and exercise. Your flesh wants to eat more chocolate cake and less healthy food. Your flesh wants to spend more money and not save more money. Your flesh flesh, uh, wants to not read your Bible, but your spirit wants to read the Bible. Your your, Your spirit wants to pray, but your flesh does not. It's a battle we face every day. Listen, and if you and I, if you're going to win this battle between the flesh and the spirit, uh, one of them has got to die. And it won't be the Spirit. It has to be our flesh. We must have a funeral for our flesh. I want to quickly this morning give us five thoughts about this funeral of our flesh. First of all, notice it's a personal funeral. I'm going to read Galatians 2.20 again and count how many times there uh, the word I or the word me is said. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in 
me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There's eight personal pronouns in this one verse. Uh, There's eight times Paul says, me or I. Now, most of Paul's writings, he was concerned about other people. He was giving help. He was teaching other people. But right here, uh, Paul in Galatians 2.20 says this, it's about me. It's about me dying to myself. It's about me not letting my flesh control me. It's about me living my life by the Spirit of God who is inside of me. Paul says, if I'm going to serve God, if I'm going to be a blessing to anybody else, if I'm going to help, teach, preach, whatever, if I'm going to do anything for God, then I have to have a funeral for my flesh. It's a personal funeral. Think about, uh, and I think about this personal funeral, I think about how Christ's death was for our salvation. By the way, those today who are saved... Let me just say this. If you're saved today, say amen. Amen. Good. The reason you're saved today is because somebody died for you. You could not die for your own sin. Christ had to die for you. Uh, Before we can be crucified with Christ, Christ had to be crucified uh, for us. And we must believe that He is, turn from our sin, repent of our sin, put our faith and trust in Him to be saved. And none of that could be possible without Him dying for our salvation. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Without His crucifixion, you and I can never crucify our flesh. So His death brings to us salvation, but our death with Christ is our sanctification. Christ's death saved me, but my death to my flesh helps to sanctify me. Remember what we said a couple weeks ago, this transformation process we're going through takes a long time. But it does not begin until you and I, we have a funeral for our flesh. Uh, until Until we die to self and die to flesh, we'll never be able to serve God. We'll never be able to live for God. We can't live for God and serve the Spirit of God until we've died to our own flesh. There must be a funeral to our flesh. This flesh, first of all, is a personal funeral. Notice also it's a painful funeral. I read through this verse several times and I noticed that Paul does not say, I have died with Christ. Notice the word he uses, the word crucified. Under the inspiration of God, Paul penned the words, I am crucified with Christ. I think about the word crucified. I think about, of course, the Lord being crucified for us, but I think about the pain I think about the misery. I think about the torment and the torture that Christ went through for me. I think about this, without a doubt, being crucified has got to be the most painful, painful way to die. I was a firefighter and medic many years, and I was there when many people died. And I've heard folks in a house fire, being burned. I've heard them screaming and hollering. I've heard, I've been there as folks are mangled up in a car crash and and how the metal is wrapped around them and their body is hurting so badly. All they can do is just scream. I've been there when folks have been stabbed and and been shot. And and listen, and and the pain, and I've heard the screams and and the hollering and the misery, and I've seen as families are affected, but I cannot imagine being crucified. I can imagine the pain, the torture going through someone's body as they have been crucified. What that means is this. As we crucify our flesh and yield to our spirit, it can be painful sometimes. Let me explain. When our flesh wants to miss church, but our spirit wants to be in church, sometimes it's going to be painful to our flesh to die to our flesh and yield to the spirit. When our flesh wants not to tithe, but our spirit knows it's right to tithe, it's going to be financially painful for a while to give in to the spirit and die to the flesh. Our flesh wants to stay home and and watch TV. Uh, Listen, it's going to be painful at first to take the remote and 
what we all hate to do is push power uh, and get up and get dressed and go to church. Listen, it's painful. It's painful sometimes to die to flesh and yield to the Spirit. But can I say to you, it's always right. It's no, no wonder sometimes even Paul talks about uh, serving Christ as being suffering because sometimes it's very painful. Sometimes being right for God causes us to have to suffer. Sometimes we have to go through fiery trials. No wonder the Bible says in 1 Peter 4, 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning this fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings that when His glory shall be revealed ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. James 1, 2, and 3 says this, My brethren... Count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing that the trial of your faith worketh patience. And one of my favorite verses is Romans 8, 18, which says this, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in them. Can I say to you today and to me, as we die to our flesh, as we put away our flesh, as we have a funeral to our flesh, it's going to be painful but it's going to be worth it. It's a painful funeral. It's a personal funeral. Number three, it's a very powerful funeral. I dare say, unless you've got an issue, and I mean that nicely, unless you've got an issue, you don't like going to funerals. Because that means somebody has passed away. That means there's somebody in your family or your friends, somebody that you love, that you're not going to see anymore until you get to heaven. Funerals can be very life-changing things as well. I was saved on September 29th, 1991, and one of the guys I worked with's name was Charlie Hyde. As a matter of fact, Charlie, Mr. Hyde was my supervisor, and uh, Mr. Hyde was also a high school baseball coach. His son excelled in baseball much like I did, so we had a lot in common. And there were some days when Mr. Hyde and I, after work, I would stay after work off the clock and hang out with Mr. Hyde and just talk about baseball and stuff. Him and I got to be very close. He was also a very, a very good Christian. He was always... He kind of reminds me of Brother Charlie. Always happy, always something's always exciting in Brother Charlie's life, much the way it was with uh, Mr. Hyde. One Friday, Mr. Hyde came to work and had a huge lump on his neck on Friday. Thursday, he was fine. Friday had a huge lump on his neck. Monday, Mr. Hyde was dead. This was a very, very aggressive tumor, and it just, it just it, in two days it killed him. Well, I was newly saved, and I had not yet been to many funerals, much less as a Christian. But I went to his funeral, and people would stand up and give testimony and, and talk about the grace of God and his family. Listen, his wife and son stood up at the funeral and said this about their husband and their daddy, who about the age of 45 or so uh, had passed away. They said this, We're glad our daddy's with the Lord, and he didn't have to suffer with cancer for very long. That funeral was powerful in my life. I think about, uh, you guys know about me, I had to bury my mother and my brother within 13 months of each other. And while I would admit, uh, planning those funerals and even attending those funerals, by the way, those were two of the worst funerals I've ever been a part of. But anyways, uh, um, but, but listen, you bury your mother and you bury your brother within 13 months of each other, that'll do something to you. It was a very powerful thing. Man. And that really got me thinking, what's really important in life? And I think it's no coincidence that very shortly after is where God called me into the ministry. Both of these events were very powerful in my life. Can I say, when you and I, when we have a funeral to our flesh. When we die to our flesh and live under the Spirit, when we put aside our flesh and forget about our flesh and, and stop serving our flesh, it's going to be very powerful in our life because when we crucify our flesh, we are really alive. Notice what Paul said. I am crucified with Christ. Wait for it. Nevertheless, I live. 
How can you crucify? How can you be crucified and then live? Well, Paul says, well, I'm crucified with Christ, with Christ. Oh, no, not for Christ, but with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. It doesn't make sense, but it's very true. The day you and I, we decide we're going to put away our flesh and die to our flesh, uh, it's very simply this. It's only then that we really begin to live. We could be saved and on our way to heaven, and praise God for that. But until we die to self and crucify our flesh, we'll not be able to live for Christ. So in reality, when we have a funeral to our flesh, really then we really begin to live. It's very powerful because we really begin to live, and also notice this, we also are really free. Before we got saved... We were servants to our sin. Our sin had a noose around our neck. The power of sin in our life was so strong that everything we did was controlled by and empowered by our sin. But thank God when we got saved, the Holy Spirit of God came in and and dwelt inside of us. And now we have the Holy Spirit of God inside of us. But we don't always choose to follow that Spirit. We don't always choose to be filled with that Spirit. But we are escaped the power of our sin. And now we have to really be free in Christ by surrendering to the Spirit and forgetting about our flesh. And then and only then are we really free because we were saved from the power of our sin. But sometimes we still want to serve Ourself. We've been made free from the bondage of our sin, but until we put away our flesh, we'll never truly be able to follow Christ. By the way, the same Jesus who had the power to forgive our sins is the same Jesus who has power that we need to put away our flesh and serve Him. I think about in the the Old Testament... I think about the children of Israel and they leave, they leave Egypt and before they get to the promised land, they have to cross two bodies of water. They have to cross the Red Sea. And that Red Sea crossing, that's a type of our salvation, how we, we leave Egypt, we leave sin, we leave the devil, and then we cross the Red Sea with the power of God, and then we begin living for Christ in the wilderness. And then before they get to the Promised Land, they come to the Jordan River, and again they have to cross that. While the Red Sea is a type of our salvation, the Jordan River is a type of our sanctification, we must cross over two rivers. Before we can enjoy life in the promised land, before we can fully serve God, before we can really live a life that God wants us to live, we have to come out of Egypt, cross the Red Sea, and then we must, and we must cross the Jordan River, be saved and sanctified, and then we can truly serve God as a Christian. Uh, listen, a funeral is a very powerful thing. It's also a very practical thing. Think about the principle of dying to self. It's something that we probably have heard about but kind of wonder what does that mean to die to self like Paul said in other portions of Scripture. Uh, we may even have remember reading where Paul said that I die daily. So what does all that mean? It's a very practical thing. Oh yes, it's very theological but it's also very practical and to be very, what's a good word? Simplistic. You know me, very simplistic. Uh, to, to just be very simple, very elementary is a good word. When you die, you stop living. So when we die to flesh, when we die to the old man, that means we stop living in the flesh. That means we stop living the old life and we start living the new life. If, when we have a funeral for our flesh, listen, we have to die or stop living for our old lusts. Lust has been defined as a longing for anything sinful. It's often referred to in the physical realm as far as sexuality, but also it means that if we lust, it means that we want something that we should not have. You realize that our flesh 
wants what it should not have? Your flesh on Sunday morning wants to stay in bed. Is it just me? Let me step over here. Is it just me or does on Sunday morning your bed feel so much better? And your pillow, I mean, it's just... To me, Saturday night sleep is just the best sleep of the week. And I think it's because the old flesh knows that come five or whenever y'all get up in the morning, you got to make a decision. Am I going to stay in this bed in the coziness of these blankets and this pillow or am I going to get up and go to church? And I also thought about this. Some of the best ball games are on on Sunday. I mean, whose idea was it to put the Super Bowl on Sunday night? And I know what it, what it is because I, I, think, I think the devil wants us to choose. Am I going to follow my flesh or follow my spirit? Well, that's next week, okay? Let's worry about this week. There's some good ball games on on Sunday. And on Wednesday night, some of the best TV shows of the week are on on Wednesday night. Why is that? It's because I know that our enemy, the devil, wants us to choose flesh or spirit. Listen, but, but as, a, as a Christian, if we're going to die to self, if we're going to have a feel for our flesh, we have to stop living for our old lusts. we got to stop wanting what we know we shouldn't have or shouldn't do. 1 John 2, 16 says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. It means as a Christian, it means that we're not going to want to do the things we used to do. It means we've got to surrender our lives to live for the things that God would have us to live for. The world wants fame, and the world wants wealth, and the world wants popularity. But when you and I, when we have a funeral for our flesh, it means that we're going to live our lives for the glory of God. The world wants to see what it can get. But when we have a funeral for our flesh, we want to see what we can give. Put away our old lust. It means we got to, number two, die to our old logic. Having a funeral for our flesh affects our actions and it also affects our attitude. Remember what Paul said in the book of Philippians chapter 4, verse 8? He said... Uh, Think about those things which are honest and pure and of a good report and just and lovely. And I didn't say those in order, so forgive me. But Paul said, you've got to change the way you think. You've, we can't change our actions until we change our attitudes. Can I say this? How many Christians still have a negative attitude? How many Christians still have bitterness in their heart? How many Christians still have unforgiveness in their heart? So how many Christians have resentment? How many Christians have jealousy in their hearts? Uh, how many Christians have pride? All this is a problem with our thinking. And when we put away our flesh, have a funeral to our flesh, we'll not live to our old, uh, our old, uh, our, our old lust or our old logic. We'll live for the glory of God. Thinking about things that are logical. Some of God's commands are not logical. Think about, from last week I think it was, think about Noah. God told Noah it's going to rain 40 days and 40 nights and all the world's all the going to be destroyed. And you know you've got to build a boat. Noah has never seen rain nor ever seen a boat. So logically, logically Noah... Probably could have said, God, uh, what's rain and what's a boat? But we read nothing about that. Noah had to have a funeral to his flesh and not live in his old logic, but follow God's logic. Remember a couple of weeks ago, or last week, whenever it was, uh, Hosea, God told him, to go marry a harlot named Gomer. Anything, the only thing worse than marrying a harlot would be a harlot named Gomer. I keep thinking that to myself. But Hosea should have said, Now, God, I know you've told me to do this, 
but I thought we should stay away from harlots, not marry them. Logically, God, I don't understand this. And quite frankly, I don't understand it either. Logically, it does not make sense for Noah to build an ark. Logically, it does not make sense for Hosea to marry a prostitute named Gomer. But that's not just for Bible people. Let me say a few things here that may sound kind of strange coming from a preacher. Logically, it doesn't make sense to tithe. I'm waiting for a response. Logically. We're talking about logically. And by the way, yes, I tithe in case you're wondering. Uh, Couldn't we not use all of our paycheck? Instead of living on 90% of our paycheck, logically, we could pay our bills better. Logically, we could go on a better vacation. Logically, we could eat out more often. Logically. But when we put away our flesh, we don't live to our old logic that says, get, get, get. We live to our new logic that says, give, give, give. Again, logically, logically, it doesn't make sense to come to church three times a week. Was one time a week not good enough? Logically, it doesn't make sense. But again, we have a funeral to our flesh, we die to our flesh, and we live unto our spirit, and the flesh says, don't be faithful, but the spirit says, do be faithful. We no longer live in our own logic, we live in our new logic, which says, I'm going to be faithful to the house of God. And so you put whatever you want to there, uh, 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 praying, uh, uh, whatever, those things logically do not make sense. But we put away our flesh. We no longer live in our old logic. We live now in our new logic. It's a very practical thing. Number five, and I'm done. The the funeral to our flesh is personal. It's painful. It's powerful. It's practical. And notice finally, it's permanent. I don't know about you, but... Another thing I think about when I think about a crucifixion is the fact that it's permanent. Now, we know that Jesus Christ was crucified. He and only He came back from a crucifixion. But everybody else, when they're dead, when they're truly dead, not just, I see the light, not just like unconscious, not breathing, but when they are truly, sure enough, dead, they're dead. It's permanent. Once you're dead, you can't come back and live. And by the way, if you're dead, we don't want you to come back and live. It'll be scary, first thing. Especially to those who are saved, once they die, they're in heaven. They don't want to come back either. Praise God for that. Uh, But the crucifixion, when we die to our flesh, if it's going to be, I can't use this word, I don't think, if it's going to be successful, if it's going to bring glory to God, there's a good word, if it's going to honor God, it's got to be permanent. We don't wake up one morning and say, today I'm going to have a funeral to my flesh, and come lunchtime I'm going to say, well, I want my flesh back. No, a crucifixion means the end. Crucifixion is permanent. <clears throat> Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. He didn't say, I will be crucified or I was crucified. He says, I am crucified. That's a present tense verb. It's a permanent verb. It means it's going to happen today. I made the decision today. Oh, yes, I'm going to battle. Oh, yes, I'm going to struggle. Oh, yes, I'm going to have problems and hard times. And oh, yes, sometimes it's going to be very, very hard to live in the Spirit. But Paul says, I'm just going to do it. Had a funeral to his flesh. It has to be something that's done not just daily, but moment by moment. Let me close with this this morning. Nobody likes funerals. But probably every one of us has probably been to one or probably will go to one in our life. But if we're going to make stewardship 
a way of living, if it's going to be a way of living, not just something we talk about, this year, bless God, this year I'm going to serve my Jesus. This year I'm going to do this. If we're going to do more than just talk about it, we've got to die to our flesh. We've got to have a funeral to our flesh. And this funeral is going to be personal. It's going to be painful. It's going to be powerful. It's going to be practical. And it should be permanent. Please stand to your feet so we can pray.